Ah. Okay. Well, if you haven't noticed uh, during this year, I've been kind of going down through the share or the search menu on family search and taking topics from the search menu, like the record search, images, the wiki. And tonight I thought I would hit two uh, topics that aren't really very often used by a lot of people. One of them is the books and the other one are the genealogies that are at family search. So I have a feeling that for a few of us, there'll be some things to learn. Okay, so we're gonna cover books and we're gonna talk about what that's all about and where it's found and how does it work? And then genealogies and we'll do the same thing. What are the genealogies? Where do we find them? How do they work? And then because it's a short presentation, I'll probably go over and do a live demo and do just a little bit of searching over there and show you how it works in real live time. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is the digital library. And so I kind of want to do it like a fairy tale a little bit. Once upon a time, Family Search had developed the single largest library of books in the world. The problem with that was that the place filled up and they ran out of room, but the number of books didn't. And so they had to do something about that. And what they eventually settled on as technology came along was to digitize their books. And then they got the bright idea that they could partner with other libraries. And the number of libraries that we partner with now is 14. And we could pool our resources to where now we have over a half a million books online. These are all genealogy books. It's maybe not the largest collection online. Uh, Google has more books, but they're the most genealogy books in one location. And so we don't have just the family search collection, but we're starting to add in books from these other libraries also. And this is called the Family Search Digital Library. Okay, and it's here for all of us to use. Oftentimes we don't really use it too much and it has a lot of great family history content, whether it be family histories or local histories or other kinds of, of collections. And who the partner libraries are, are some of the top libraries in the United States. And so like the Allen County Public Library, which is a gigantic library, I've been to that one. That's one of, that was our first partner. Also the Midwest Genealogy Center, which is in Independence, Missouri, is another one of them. And so all of these libraries are now either digitizing their own books or letting us help them digitize books. And as they're digitized, they're put online they're actually even located in our family history library catalog. So that the catalog you would think has the things for family search, but it also has the books that are being shared from these libraries listed in there too. And if we can link to them, the link is right there. Okay, and so this is a growing collection if I would put an absolute number down, you could go in today and there would be more. Okay, so what can we find in here in this half a million plus books? There's family histories. That's the genealogies of the various families. Then there's those county and local history books and all kinds of books about the genealogy and the records in various counties and states, countries things like that. There's a lot of genealogical magazines and there's things like uh, if families have put out a, a publication on a regular basis, then their magazines could be in here. Gazetteers are there. They even have medieval histories and pedigrees and things like that. There are all kinds of genealogical things. Okay, there are different levels of permission, and this is important. 
Some of them will be marked public. Those are books that are so old now that they do not have any copyright protections at all. In other words, they're free to be viewed, to copy, download, no problems. Then there are things that are protected. And you'll find a lot of books in here are listed as protected. Those are books that are under copyright and you can't view them online. And you might wonder, well, then why did Family Search go and put them in here? Well, I talked to one of my managers who's an employee at the library and they said there are several reasons. One of them is, okay, the book's under copyright today. Eventually that copyright's going to expire. And when it expires, they'll have it digitized and ready for the public to use. Secondly, they might be able to get permission from the copyright holder to have it public. And so that's the second reason. And the third reason is they want you to know that that book exists. You might not be able to use it here, but knowing that there's a book and you know now the title and the author, you can go searching to see where you might be able to either buy it or find it in a library near you. So it's okay to have books we can't get to. It's frustrating though, because it always seems like the one you really want is one that's marked as protected, but it is what it is. Another one is one that has full permission. Those are those books that are actually copyright protected, but the author has given the church permission to let people view it online. Another type of permission is limited permission. These are books that have a copyright protection. They can be viewed online, but they can't be printed or downloaded. I've never run across one of those yet, but obviously that's a permission that's out there. Probably not used too often. And then the one that we do run into, the one that drives all of us crazy, is the member permission one, which means it's the one that you see you have to go to the Family History Center to view it. And occasionally uh, you have to actually be a member of the church and sign in to be able to view it. And some of these are actually viewable only at the partner library that shared it with Family Search, but I really don't see that very often. Usually it's just the ones that have these restrictions that we're used to seeing on the films. Okay, so how do we access it? We go to our little search, it, search menu, and then from the search menu, we go to books. And this is what the top of the page will look like. That search bar is all there is there. Because you, you don't have a regular search like you have for records and things like that. And so what you do here is you can put in a surname, you can put in a place, you can put in an event, you can put in an author, you can put in a title of a book if you're looking for a specific book. You can say something like Givens Family and get anything that has Givens and Family in it. Okay, so we'll run through this briefly and show you a little bit about how it works. So what I did is I chose the surname Bowser and so we put search and we write Bowser and we just click search and up comes results. These are the first two results. And I decide I wanna look at the second one. And so we wanna look at this Bowser family history. Will I be able to view it? It says it's public. That means yes, I can view it, hooray. So to start viewing it, I have two options. I can either click where the arrow is on the title, or I can click on the little picture of the cover of the book. Those are the two ways that will get me to the book. Now there's a thing that says full text results down there. That does not get you to the book. 
that just gets you to a bunch of details about the book, but it doesn't get you to the book. So you don't want to click there. So you either click on the title or you click on the little picture. And then when you come to that page, you're not ready yet to actually view it, but you get the details on it. It has an ID number. This actually came from a microfilm. It tells you the creator, Addison Bowser, and the Bowser reunion. It's in English. The rights are from Family Search. Access level is public. They give you search terms. So this gives you an idea that there's a lot of stuff on the surname John and Flinter, Berkheimer, Moore, Bowser, Bowser, Bowser. So you know this much about the book. Over here on the left side, it tells you that there are 310 pages. And if you want to view them, you just click there. And up comes the page that you're actually going to be able to start viewing with. The page comes in two parts. There's the left side, which is that information panel. You can remove it from the screen. There's a little X up here. You can exit out there. And there's a little I down below, and we'll show you in a second. That also will remove it or add it back in. And then the right side of the page is the actual viewer of the book. And this is just like Google would be, you're going to be able to click through the book, or you can pick using the little number thing down here in the bottom, select a certain page number to go to. OK, this is really a very, very well done viewer. So first off, if you want to get rid of the left side, you can just click over here where the little I is or the X up above, and that will collapse that off the screen. In the information box, that's the information box. Then you can change how you view this. You can view a single page. And if you're doing that and you want to see the next page, all you do is click over here on next, the little right arrow in this case. There is no left arrow right now because this is page one of the book, or this is image one of the book. If we were in the middle of the book, there would be an arrow on both sides. Okay, I can come down here where it has the little two page icon. And I can click that and it will show two pages at a time on the screen. So you see a side by side view. And where I have the little green arrow will allow you to toggle between one page like it is right now or two pages side by side. You can toggle back and forth. And then in the red box down here are all the cool things, the plus and minus to enlarge the image, make it smaller, make it full screen, make it so you have several pages that you can flip through that are all showing, refresh or go back, the brighten or lighten it. And so you have several different things here to help you. I think the one that's the, the I called it uh, refresh is not, it's for rotating so that you can rotate the image. So there's a several different things you can do with it. Okay, now I've gone in and I want to actually search inside the uh, book. There's a magnifying glass, is one of those icons down there. I put in Ohio. And it said 60 results. And over here, this has actually got a drag bar. I could drag down through the book and see all the pages that have, whoops, that have the word Ohio in it. This particular page had a whole bunch of Ohio's in it. But if I click on that page, then the page shows up over here on the right-hand side. And I can look at it more carefully. Then if I want to see the next one, I can pull the drag bar down 
whoops, we're going crazy here. I can drag the drag bar down and it'll take me to the next, next page and I can click on it and see what's there. So there's ways to search within the book for the text that you're looking for. And then you can decide what you want, you know, what you want to see. Now, what I didn't say here is there's also, if you notice, if it's allowed, there's a little box with the down arrow. Most of these books that are public, you can download. And there's no restriction on that. As long as that box is there, download it. And you know, I've done this for a lot of the books that I've done searching. And if I have a lot of stuff in the book, why not download it and save it on my computer? <clears throat> Excuse me. I've got all kinds of data files on my computer. And this is just an easy way to build up my collection of records so that I don't have to come back to Family Search to find it. I just go to my, my documents and look up the book, open it up and do my searching. Okay, so why use this? Because often these books contain compiled ped pedigrees and descendancies that aren't over in family search. Why reinvent the wheel if somebody else has already researched it? They can contain a lot of sources of information that aren't available online. They can have stories and facts and things that we're not aware of. But there is always that one caveat, and that is if you're borrowing from somebody's book, you got to beware it can contain errors. So you want to go through and treat it with caution, double check things, verify what's there, and then go ahead and, and use it if it's good. But this is a very underutilized thing. This is where I go when I'm really trying to find the details about my ancestors, especially if I'm back in the early 1800s or 1700s. And I want to learn about these people. This is where I find the books that people have written that have all those neat details about my ancestors. OK. The genealogies, this is the one that most of us have probably never even known was there. And so this is something I really hope that you'll take a chance to use and remember because there may be times when you're working with patrons where these genealogies can be helpful. Okay, well, where do we find them? Well, it's in the search menu again, and it's down there under genealogies on the drop down. And for 125 years, Family Search, which used to be called the Genealogy Society of Utah, has been collecting genealogies of all kinds. Now, these are not books. These are online genealogies. They've been con collecting our genealogy, and they had to have a place to put all this because they had a lot of different collections. And then they had opportunities to add to it with new things that are digital. And so they needed a place to put them. And so this is a catch-all category for a whole slew of different things. OK, the genealogies have some things you're familiar with and maybe some things you aren't familiar with. The ancestral file is in here. Now, that was the backbone for New Dot Family Search, which became Tree. That's what the whole thing began with. This is the thing that we worked with back in the 90s. The pedigree resource file came along and replaced the ancestral file when we finally retired it. And it's available in its original form here. Then the IGI the International Genealogical Index, which carried the genealogical information of the temples all the way up until the time that we started using Family Search, Family Tree. And at that point, it was cut off. So this has all the 
the names of the people that were submitted back in the time prior to our new dot family search and the tree that we have now. Then there are some community trees. That's another category. There's a collection called the Guild of One Name Studies. Oral genealogies, which is something fairly new. And then with, from some of our partners, partner trees. There are some things here I didn't even know were collected because this collection continues to grow. So we'll go through each of those. Ancestral file, just for your information, it debuted in 1979. Prior to that, we had the Temple Index Bureau and we had the little TIB cards. And that was what had all the temple information that we could get our hands on. And then starting in 1979, they decided let's put together, like they had the old family group sheets and pedigree charts, let's put together a digital program because they were just getting into digitizing things. By 1988, they finally published it online. By 1990, they had it in CD-ROM form and they closed it off in 2003. So the current edition that's here is the one they published in November 2011, and that date's significant. That's the date they rolled out New Dot Family Search. And so at that point, they froze the ancestral file. It had 40 million names in it. Okay, the version that we can access in genealogy has no notes or sources in it. The submitters' names have been redacted for privacy's sake, unfortunately. It's actually a little less useful than the old CD-ROM version where we could actually see who submitted something. But it has all the submissions. They're there now, with all their errors and corrections that are needed and they can't be changed. So what you see is what you get, and there are duplicates there. You're going to find if you have old LDS lines that you're going to probably have more than one of your ancestors. Okay, when would you want to use it? Well, the one thing in it that is good that I learned by reading up on this are the pre-1500 European royal and noble families. That information was carefully included in the ancestral file and is probably more accurate than family tree by far. It also provides you with what the original pedigree structure for your family looked like at the beginning of new dot family search. So if somebody's messed up your pedigree and you're not sure what used to be there, you could go back here to the ancestral file and see what it looked like back in the old days, if that's necessary. Okay, the pedigree resource file. It debuted in May of 1999. People were encouraged to send in their JEDCOMs, which in those days was a big deal because it was a new type of of technology. Now, last DVDs, they put them on DVDs and released them. We used to have them in the family history centers, hundreds of them. The last DVDs were released in 2010. They can discontinued all the CDs and DVDs in 2012. In other words, they quit selling them and all that sort of thing. There's about 220 million records in there. In other words, 220 million people. But you can still submit your JEDCOM to it today. It does not go to the DVDs or the CDs. It goes online. And it becomes a place where you could store a backup of your path file or your roots magic file or ancestral quest file. And other people would be able to view it. You can't change anything. So if you updated it, you could go in and delete it and put a new version on in. So that's something that you can use this for. 
Okay, benefits. You can go from a person in the pedigree resource file to the person in tree. They are linked. The pedigree resource file people and family tree are linked so that you can go into tree for a person. The one thing you can't do is you can't download those JEDCOMs. Those trees that are in pedigree resource file are a static file. Unfortunately, you're just going to have to write down what you see. And it's in individual submission format. Think of all the trees at Ancestry and all the duplicates. That's what you're going to find in the pedigree resource file. But these have sources and notes. They are displayed. There's no multimedia, but the sources and notes for people are there. So there could be some good information. If you're having a problem with a line, go over here and search for your person and look for the ones that have sources with them. You may find something good. And like I said, you can delete an old submission of yours and then upload a new one if you want. Okay, the IGI. It was started in 73. It was called the computer index, file index. It was put on microfiche and they had about 20 million names in 1973. It's kind of fun to watch this because you see the growth of temple work in the church. In 1981, they renamed it the IGI. And by 1984, there were 108 million records. That's about five and a half times as many records in 11 years. In 1993, they first put them on CDs. And at that point, there were over 2 million, 200 million records. And in 1999, Family Search website was released. The IGI was put out on the website as a live file, and there were 285 million names. And when new dot family search came along, though, in 2012, they retired the IGI. So now using this, Here's the thing that I dislike. I wish they had left on, but I guess it makes it easier for the non-members to use. The temple data was stripped from the records. So we can no longer see, if I see this record, I can know what the temple date was that went with that record for an ordinance. The temple data was stripped. I do know if I find people in the IGI that their temple work was done. So that is good. All the temple data separ is separated into patron contributions versus extracted contributions. And that's good because that's important. If it's a patron contribution, it's garbage in, garbage out. It's only as good as the patrons work. The extracted contributions are actual extractions from databases, and those tend to be pretty accurate. And so, you, and, and they have the numbers of the, the uh, what do you call it, the batch numbers that go with these submissions. If a batch number started with a, num a letter, it's an extracted one. If it started with a number, it came from a patron. You will not find death records here, except possibly little children, infants, because in, other than that, death dates are never used in temple work. And so you're not gonna be able to search by death. Okay, so here's an example. Here's what happens. If you go to a record in the IGI and you click on it, it opens up a little pedigree. And on it, it's going to show the person with their record number. That record number means that there was an ordinance done for Henry and that ordinance was assigned to that record number in tree. It was interesting. I followed this particular one earlier today. That record number is a deleted record now. It's been merged. 
So it's been archived, but it'll tell you that it went to this other record. So I went to this other record. It now has been archived and merged into another record. And I had to go through three merges until I finally found the record today, which happens to be in my pedigree because this is my great grandfather. It's the actual record in the pedigree that has that ordinance now, whatever it was, attached in there. And so I was able to follow it using record numbers to the actual record that's in tree today. Okay, the other thing they show you when you click on the person's name is they show you all this information that's way over on the side, including the batch numbers. And I can see that this was a batch number that began with a number. So it was a member submission, most likely my own submission. Okay, so you find that by clicking on the person's name. So this can be very useful, other than the fact that they took the temple dates, you know, ordinance dates out of it, unfortunately. Okay, community trees are something we may have never even heard of. Back in May of 2015, the community trees databases were combined in the genealogy section of the website. They had had a bunch of things that were kind of loosey goosey hanging around and so they took them all and merged them together. These are all kinds of projects, some big, some little. They're things like lineage link genealogies for a specific like locality or time period, or they could be um, some town or community that people were going through and creating a genealogy database for that community. These things can have a lot of supporting sources or the database could be made from a single source. But these have all been lumped together so that you can search them by people's names and locations and things like that. And there are printing options in these trees so that you can print out stuff that you find. Like I said, the scope can be from very small grassroots village township things to large collections. Okay, and there are some genealogical and historical societies that are working with Family Search to build these. I knew a couple of missionary friends who were extracting all the, the cemetery records in a town in England and putting this up in a database, and it became one of the community trees. And they were working at combining or connecting the families. So these weren't just loose names from individual plots, but they researched out the families and put everybody together. So it's a very interesting collection. A lot of different things that we might not realize are around there. Okay, and like I say, the scope, it can be big, it can be little. And these are updated, so they're a work in progress. So what you see today, there might be more next year. Okay, Guild of One Name Studies is a little different. This is a uh, actual group over in England, and they started this program so that people that are researching a single name can like a certain surname, like say Givens, and they're doing all the Givens is trying to find all the Givens lines in the world and put them together, they would have a place to work together. Well, most of these one name studies develop a pedigree program for their records. And these pedigrees have been put into family search. And so if there's a Jones one name study, then the Jones pedigrees should be in here. 
And so this is a, like I say, a group that's not family search at all, but they partnered with family search to provide a place for their records to be displayed. Okay, so uh, these things date back maybe to the 1960s. So this is oral genealogy, excuse me. I've got problems. I've got the thing on the top of the screen that I wanna have go away and I can't get it to go away. Okay, oral genealogies. Okay, anyway, the church realized there are places in the world that there's no written language. And so starting in the 1960s in Polynesia, the church started dabbling in gathering oral genealogies. They got serious about it in 2004 and they went to Ghana to begin a study to see how this would work and gather oral family histories there. By 2016, it became clear that they could really enlarge this effort by calling people to do this. And they started putting funds available. They got 5,000 people hired to take interviews and they're working, they were working in 15 countries by 2016 in Africa. And all those countries are there. By 2024, they expect to have over a half a million interviews done. And it's going to preserve over 190 million names. The church is doing this because this is going to be the only way to get genealogical information for the temple for a lot of these areas. Okay, and so they're, they're working feverishly to grow this. And they've expanded it to where now they're also got projects in Gambia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Guam, the Mariana Islands, Israel, several of the Polynesian islands, including Hawaii, New Zealand, Samoa, Tonga, and on and on. They are gathering these oral genealogies for people so that if you run into patrons who have either African ancestry or any of these areas in the Pacific, especially, especially Polynesian, there are projects and these are searchable. And you actually can go here and listen to the person giving the information or read the, the transcription of the story. It's just fascinating. Okay, partner trees, the last one of these. Again, it's a static collection. In other words, it can't be altered, edited, and things like that of lineage trees that were submitted prior to 2020 by the users of mytrees.com and then other family search partners like Roots Finder or American Ancestors where they have trees. And so you can go into their trees and search for your ancestors there too. So Seeing these genealogies, what you're going to do is you're going to go to search and then click on genealogies and you're going to get a person search screen. And so you can go ahead and do a person search with the same parameters and things that you're used to doing. And um, the default though, is it searches everything. Now you may want that, but you're probably gonna find you're gonna get all kinds of results that you're not interested in. And so what you're really gonna wanna do is probably go over to collection and then select something that you wanna search. Okay, now this says questions, but what I'd rather do is let me Stop sharing my presentation. And if I can find my browser. 
let's go to the browser and I will go over here to family search, sign in, say a prayer that it works. I'm going to come down here to genealogies and I'll just do a simple search. I'll do my great grandfather again. And I'm going to do a search for him just with his name, just so I can get everything I can. I can come over here and make edits and changes to my search. But it tells me I've got 11,000 results. Okay. And it starts feeding me things. This is a tree from mytrees.com. Here's a tree that he's in at Roots Finder. But I want to look at collection. So when I click on collection, I can see that his name or something similar is found 208 times in ancestral file, 107 times in the community trees, 14 times in the Guild of One Name Studies, 4,000 times plus in the IGI. I am sure it's not all my Henry Harrison Sands. It could be Henry Sands, it could be Henry H. Sands, J. H. Sands, and things like that. Even 23 oral genealogies, which is interesting. Ancestry or partner trees, American Ancestors, or mytrees.com, or Roots Finder, pedigree resource file, and something called synthetic trees, whatever that is. So if I wanted to see like the IGI, I could go over here and click on IGI and say, apply that. And I will get just things from the IGI. And all four of these are actually him. And this is where I went and did my little search and said, okay, let's see Henry. And here he is in his tree. Can't see him because it's too little. But here's that record number. I can go to that record number in family search. Or I can click on him and I can see the information here about him, what batch it was in, all that kind of stuff. Now that's genealogies. Just a real quick little run, just to get you a feel for it. Books is over here. And I could put in here like, uh, Crowbridge, one of my new lines that I just found, I broke a, a um, brick wall this last year and the Trowbridge family is now my ancestry. So see, I searched for the name, Throwbridge, came up with 3000 results. I doubt they're all really Throwbridge. This first one's a book and it's public, so I'll click on the picture and I'll find out if I look at it carefully. I think it was printed in 1894. So it's an old book, Francis Bacon Trowbridge wrote it. It's 900 pages long. I can click on it here. If I wanna go to page 300, I can change that number down there or I'll make it 332. I'll go to page 332. There it is, I can enlarge it and I can read it. Let's see what's there, see there's all kinds of great detail information about these people, not just names and dates and places, but actual information. These are great. Now I could go back and I could do a, a search. Uh, let's see, back to search results. Let's go back in this book again. What I wanted to do was to do a specific search in it. And let's see my Trowbridge married a nail. 
Unfortunately, nail also comes in a metal thing you hammer into walls. And yep, I'm going to see a bunch of results that talk about regular nails or something called nails born, which is a place somewhere. But I could search for other surnames doing that. So these are real good. I really like these uh, sections. I use the books a lot. This will be a book that I'm going to click on and download and add to my collection because I know it has my line. It goes back all the way into Connecticut from Maryland where my people were at when I tie into them all the way back to Puritan days. Okay, let's see. Is there anything in the chat that I'm missing? I don't see anything. Okay, I will stop sharing and I will turn off the recording. And are there any questions? Bob, can you have everybody check the chat? <laughs> 